Okay, everyone, we'll get started shortly, waiting for more people to join. But instead of sitting here awkwardly, I thought maybe I'd show you guys if you haven't seen it yet, you can build memes in Grist. So <laughs> while we wait for people to join in, this is a template um, that's in our gallery just for fun. It's, take, it's making use of our uh, custom widget that shows images from a URL. So you can, and then you can just write text and you can adjust the size and move it around. And it's just different fun things you can do um, with Grist, which is like a spreadsheet on steroids. So this one asking for dark mode in Grist, this is something that our CTO has wanted for a while, maybe one day. And I made this Drake one. Instead of doing work in a spreadsheet, you can make memes in a spreadsheet. Okay, I think we'll start in a minute here. Can anyone hear me? Can, oh, yeah, I think so. Oh. Okay. Awesome, thanks Gil. What are the other ones that are here? We have Dark Mode and Grist, Twitter one, a Monty Python reference. I think I need a dev to explain this one to me. A sad looking tree. <laughs> you can make whatever you want. Okay. So I think we can um, get started at least with the questions that some of you sent in during registration. Um, so I'm just yeah, we'll check the time. Okay, so one of the questions someone sent in is about uh, calendar data sharing and whether or not Gris supports it. So we don't yet have a calendar widget, though it is something we'd like to implement. In the meantime, you can connect Gris to a calendar like Google Calendar using a third-party integrator like Zapier. So um, for example, you can connect Google Calendar to Gris, and then there's a bunch of uh, actions and triggers that you can set up that could send information either in either direction. Another question was about setting up an invoice to match QuickBooks. So if you look in our template gallery, we have this invoice custom widget. And what this does is as you select an invoice, it updates, um, as you select data on your table, it updates what the invoice looks like. But if you want to change the look of this to look um, in particular to your business or whatever it is that you need, you do need to know a little bit of code and you need some development skills. And if that's something that you don't have on hand or don't have the time to figure out, you can take advantage of the Sprouts program. So the Sprouts program um, is a program that will pair you with someone who's a Grist expert who has these skills. We'll give you a 30 minute free consultation call, see what your needs are and advise you on how to move forward. You can find this page from our homepage or uh, go to resources, talk to an expert, and then you can send an inquiry. Someone asked if it's possible to have a widget as a gallery view, um, for example, uh, the, in inventory. So in our inventory man manager, we have this uh, attachment column that has photos of different products. If you add more than one, Grist um, will sort of tile it based on your column width and a grid. If you need something more custom than this, you can also build that with a custom widget. Also here it looks small, but if you double click, it'll open in a light box and you can scroll through it um, as a carousel if you have multiple images. But if you need something custom, uh, feel free to reach out on Sprouts as well. Someone asked about webhooks. So we do have now uh, Zapier instant triggers. That's different from the normal triggers. It's a lot quicker. It's only support, the instant triggers are only supported on Zapier. So that's one way you can set up webhooks. And they also asked about pivot tables. We'll be covering summary tables on this webinar. Um, they also asked how to create custom pie charts and line graphs of monthly expenses. We'll be covering that as well in today's webinar. And we'll be covering uh, two different ways to set up charts. So for example, we have this chart in our general ledger template, which um, just updates as you add more and more data over time. And it's charting two different uh, companies' profits. Or you can have dynamic charts that update as you drill into your data. And we'll be doing both kinds today. Someone also asked how to implement the extended internal rate of return function. And, uh, so this is super cool, but beyond the scope of this webinar, Feel free to ask in our um, community, ask for help formulas. Uh, our whole team looks at this and I think we'll have a lot of fun figuring out how to do this. 
And in general, if you need formula help, feel free to reach out on the community forum. And then um, Chris asked, I don't know if he's here yet, but Chris asked about secrets. So I'll show you guys a secret. There's all these little things that those of us who work at Chris know about, um, and it's fun whenever you get to learn them. So when you're in a document, if you go to the user menu and you look at the document settings, you maybe have never come in here. You can do things like set your time zone, um, your currency. Like these are the defaults for those types of columns as well. Like in a date column, what's the time zone um, or the currency in a numeric column. And you can also switch between if you're using Python 2 or 3, but that's not the secret. The secret is that this emoji is a button. And what this button does is it reboots the entire um, uh, document. So uh, is there on YouTube. So uh, the, this is helpful if you sort of get yourself into like a log jam, like you're doing a lot of stuff with formulas and maybe you make a mistake and now it's taking really long to load or not loading at all, something, something got broken, you can just reboot the whole thing. Um, I mean, I can also just click it now and it'll just refresh this. Nothing bad will happen, even though it's a scary looking emoji, but that emoji is a secret button. Okay. Um, I think we can start the webinar. So today we're going to cover a very typical use, ca use case. This is our ninth webinar. You can watch recordings of previous webinars on YouTube. Um, but today what we're going to cover is expense tracking which is something that you might have encountered in your professional lives. And we're going to start this webinar a little weird because we're actually going to start in Excel. We're going to look at how these workflows are typically handled in Excel, and then we're going to see how we can improve on them in uh, Grist. So the way that this normally works, or the way it's worked at past companies that I've worked at, is every employee gets this blank template where every month they need to enter the month and the year, their name, department, position, manager, and add expenses. So the date of the expense, normally there's a drop-down menu for account, which is similar to a department. There's an expense type, which is also a drop-down menu. You can write the description. You can put in some totals um, that get summed up, and you can add some notes for that entire month. And then um, these drop-down menus are normally contained within the same document. So there's usually all these hidden sheets that are in here. There's a hidden sheet here that has like these lists, which means if somebody is using an old template instead of the most current one, they may not have the most recent list and that can cause problems for accounting when they're trying to reconcile everyone's different expenses. Um, but so uh, employees need to do this every single month, send it over to accounting, but then someone in accounting has the much more difficult job of reconciling all of these spreadsheets. And the way that I've typically seen this set up is They'll have a different sheet for each month. So they'll put all of May in one sheet, all of June in another sheet, and then they'll have a dashboard that summarizes all of that using a lot of formulas. And while it works, it's a lot of steps. Every time you add someone new, you need to calculate their totals. I did it real simply here with the sum. They could be doing VLOOKUPs or index match. Um, and then you need to pull it all here. And every time you add a new month or um, a new employee or a new account, you need to update formula ranges, add things to these tables manually. So there's a lot of steps, which means there's a lot of places where human error could mess this up. Uh, and if and the more complicated the formulas, like I have this sum ifs one here, uh, the more likely that either not everyone on the team knows how this works and knows how to update it. So you're overly reliant on the one person who does or just human error can come into play. And then the second way that I've seen these set up is um, a little bit more grist-like, but not quite. So here, everything is on one sheet instead of separate sheets. Um, and we're trying to add a bit more structure. Uh, and we're using pivot tables to summarize what's in this table. It's better. It's a less work. You don't need to adjust as many formulas every time you add something. But the problem here is when you do add new data, you still do need to update the source data in each one of these pivot tables. And um, if someone makes a change in here, if someone noticed something was wrong or is fixing something, uh, this doesn't automatically update and you may not realize that. So your totals are off. You have to force a refresh every single time. And here we added this extra column for month to extract the month from the date in order to summarize by month as well. We'll be doing that in Chris, but I just wanted to point that out for when we import this data. So it's a bit better. And also you're sort of limited in how this data is displayed. So as this gets very long, you have many months, many employees, more accounts, it's not easy to see these sums. This is the way that it looks. Um, I've seen some Excel spreadsheets where people use, get really fancy and pour weeks into making this look better, but 
we're going to do that in minutes in Grist, hopefully. So let's go over to Grist and let's simplify this workflow. So we're going to start with a blank Grist document. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the data that we already have. So I'm going to import from file. And I'm importing from the pivot table because it's already more or less got the structure I like. Everything is in one table. So let's um, import that. So we have the column for who the employee is, um, uh, month, date, the account, expense site, description. And then there's these two extra columns that were from the pivot table. Um, if you remember, it's these two columns here. We'll just delete those after the import. Um, and then there's this other table, this other sheet, which has these lists. We could import it, but I already thought ahead on how I want to set this up and we don't really need to. So I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna handle that differently. But let's go ahead and import this table that we have here. So let's do a little bit of cleanup. Uh, we don't need these two um, columns. They don't make sense. We don't, this isn't how pivot tables are done in GRIS. We're gonna create our own pivot tables. In the totals, um, over here in the creator panel, which you can open and close with this button on the top right, we want to format the column. So we're going to move away from table into the column menu, and we're going to format this as currency. Description, that's text, that looks good. Here, we want this to be from a drop-down menu to limit what people can enter. We, you could do that with a reference. Like if we had imported that table, we could reference that table, but I want to do it with a choice column. So what Gris does is it's going to look at all of the choices that are here and it's going to add all of the unique ones and it's going to add it to this um, list here. This is the list of, cho of total choices, but we don't know for sure if every single possible choice is being represented in just these 18 rows. So it's actually better if we go um, over here and we take the full list and I'm going to bring that into Gris just so I know I have everything that I need. So I'm going to do control A to select all, backspace to delete. Control V to paste them all in. And now I know I have the full list. I'm going to apply that. So now we're choosing from that list. And when someone's typing, it'll start filtering based on what they're entering. Okay. And then we can do the same thing for this uh, column. And in this one, it's more clear that you're not getting all of the choices. So here we see that there's three, marketing, finance, and administration. But in truth, there's four. There's operations. It just wasn't captured in those 18. So we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to come in here and just make sure we have the full list. In the date column, maybe we want to change the formatting, do a different format. So the month column in the Excel sheet was a formula. Um, we're going to also use a formula, but formulas don't import from Excel into Grist. We're going to use a formula here that applies over the entire column. That's a key difference from Excel where formulas apply over a range or an array. Here it's over an entire column where we're going to take this date and we're going to extract from it. Um, we're going to format it, it with month and year. So I'm going to convert this data column, which has a string right now, into a formula column. I'm going to take the date. I'm going to use the Python method, strf time, uh, string format time. And I'll show you where you can find these codes. There's these little codes you can use to um, code, like how you're going to display the thing that you're extracting from the date, and I'll show you where you can find them. But I'm just going to go ahead uh, and chop off the date here. How you edit dates, we have a webinar on column types and formatting, and you can look at that and see all the options that are there for dates. But what I have here is the year and the month. If you Google STRF time codes, the very first result you will get is this cheat sheet, which is great. So you can see that I did the capital Y to get the four digit year the lowercase m to get the two digit month with the zero in the front for the single digit months and what the other options are as well. And we can also go ahead and we can um, hide this column. We don't need it to be showing an order to do all the things that we wanna do. So that's still just working, but it's out of sight. Okay, so we did our cleanup. Now we're ready to create summary tables. So we're gonna add a whole new page uh, where we're going to start summarizing all of this data. We could do it here, but it'll make this page very busy. So when you're summarizing data in Grist, you select the table you want to summarize, and then you click this sigma icon uh, to start summarizing. Now you can start grouping by particular fields, but let's look at what happens when you don't group, just to get a sense of what, what's actually happening with the summary table. So if there's no group, I'm summarizing the whole table. I'm going to add that. Um, 
it's just summarizing all of the records. So in this table, we have 18 records. So it's counting that. And it's going to automatically sum up all numeric columns. In that table, there's only one numeric column, which is that total. So this isn't super helpful. We can edit this underlying data from the creator panel as well. So this table, we can either, either edit and configure the widget, we can do sort and filter, or we can edit the data. So I now want to group by month. So it's going to take those 18 records that we have. Eight of them are in May, 10 of them are in June, and it's breaking down those totals. So we're starting to build these pivot tables. The next thing I want to do is I might want to be able to click on a month and then see employees who incurred expenses in that month. So I'm going to add a widget to this existing page instead of creating a new page. Again, I'm summarizing the same uh, underlying table, and I'm doing month and employee, and I want it linked to this widget we just created that's summarizing by month. So what I'm saying is when I select a particular month, I want this new widget to update. So when I click on May, I see the May expenses. When I click on June, I see the, the employees who incurred expenses in June. And I'm going to go ahead and start hiding things that aren't super useful, like the count isn't very useful. I don't need to repeat the month here. Um, I can hide the count as well. And then maybe the next thing I want to do is I want to say, okay, let's take it a step further for each employee. I want to see what accounts they're spending in. So I can just continue drilling in if I wanted to. So I'll just show you what that looks like. So I'm doing it by month and employee and account. And this time it's selected based on the employee in month. So again, I can hide what's not as interesting. I'm doing this a slow way. You can also just click over here. So if I just want account and total, I can also just hide columns from over here. And I can drag and drop to move things around. So I want it at the end. So I can click on a month, click on a particular employee and see what accounts um, they're spending in. And maybe I want to do it the other way. Maybe I want, give me all of the accounts and then from the accounts, show me the employee. So I'm going to do that a little bit faster, but I just want to show you all the different ways that you can combine this and then we'll build some charts. So I want to do employee and account also selected by the month and I can hide these things. So now I'm seeing in each month, what is the breakdown by account? And then I want to find out um, the employees spending in those accounts based on the month and account. So I'm going to just move things around a little bit. Um, and I'm going to uh, hide some stuff. I'm going to hide the month over here, the account, the account. Okay. So um, this is helpful. Things are updating as I click through. I'm drilling in from left to right. Um, it's a little bit easier to see, but also charts are very visual. So what if we wanted to see spending per month over time? We want to do that in a bar chart. So it's a similar thing. We're still summarizing data because a chart is summarizing data. So we want to summarize by month and we want to build a chart. And this one, we're not selecting by anything. We just want, as we add more and more months, this chart should just incorporate um, those months into the chart. So let's configure this chart. Bar chart sounds good to me. X axis month sounds good. I don't want both series. I just want the total. So I'll just get rid of the count. So I can see how much the total spending in May versus June. And then maybe I also want when I click on a particular month, what is the breakdown in each account? So now I do want a dynamic chart similar to what we saw in the general ledger template. So it's a, it's a similar thing. So we're going to add a widget to the page. So we want to summarize by month and account. In each month, what is the breakdown by account? I want a chart, and I want it to update based on my selection of month. So it feels the same as creating a summary table, only instead of a table, I have a chart. So let's go ahead and configure this. A pie chart might be nice. Uh, the label that I want is the account, and I don't need the count. I just need the totals. So when I click, it'll update based on the spending in each category. And maybe I want this somewhere else. Maybe I'll put it over here and I can just drag and drop and these things will all adjust as I drag and drop. Okay, so we have a dashboard and we've imported our expenses. What happens now when we import additional expenses, right? So part of the headache was setting up the dashboard and the second part is what happens when you add new data. Well, let's actually name this dashboard. Um, we'll put expenses summary. I'm going to put it at the top so you can drag and drop pages. Also, this table, this was a blank table from the blank document we first created it. 
we can delete it. Um, so when I click remove, there's these two options because this is the only place where this table shows up. Do I only want to delete this page, this view of it, but still keep the table secret hidden, or do I want to also delete it? Um, the way you can see what your actual tables are is in raw data. So you can see I have the expenses and that blank table. So if I only delete the view, this table will still be here. So raw data is a way to see like, what are my actual tables of data? Because you might create many views of the same data, right? Which is what we're doing here. These are views of the same different widgets playing on the same underlying data. So let's go ahead and remove this. We do want to delete the data and the page. We don't need this blank table. So let's import. Um, so Janice, she sent us her July expenses. Let's go ahead and import from file. Janice's expenses. So we want to add it to the existing table, not to a new table. We're not updating any existing records. If you want to see how to do that, um, our previous webinar covers that a little bit. You can see the recording. But in this case, we're matching certain columns. So um, there's no employee column in uh, Janice in this table. It, some of you who are, might already be importing from Excel to Gris might be wondering why this is being skipped. It's because Excel lets you make a table within a table. It's very confusing, but it's how I did this. So um, uh, you could just lop this off, just cut this off and make this the first row um, to make that your headers. But uh, there's no employee table here. So you could either skip it or you can write a formula to transform what's happening here. Um, so in this case, I just want to write Janice's name. And if I want to enter a string, I want to do that between um, uh, quotation marks. So that's again, Python syntax. So this is saying we're adding this text, this text string. And if I do that, you can see that it's adding it in. So I'm not skipping, I'm transforming as I'm importing. Date matches correctly, account goes to account, expense type, description, total. And these weird um, rows here, that's from this. We'll just, uh, I meant to highlight, that's from this. We'll just lop that off after we do the import, similar to like what we did with the pivot table. Okay, so here's the new Janus ones. I'm actually gonna go ahead and just move. We have um, these notes that are for the whole thing. It might be better if we had notes in line. So let's just add another column here where we can write notes. It's a, we're gonna format it as a text column with some line wrapping, maybe give it a little bit more space. Let me give myself more space. You can open and collapse the pages menu over here. Also, Something that accounting probably also has to deal with is they're getting all of these um, spreadsheets. And a lot of this also requires receipts, images of receipts, PDFs of receipts, and they need to reconcile these two things. We can just drop receipts right in here as well. So Janice sent us a receipt. So uh, we'll make this an attachment column where we can just attach media right in here. So uh, she said she had sent us this note with um, this one, I think, yep. And this, so it was just in line now. It's just easier to see what the actual notes are instead of for the whole month. It's just in line with the thing that matters. And she also um, sent this receipt. So it's right here, the sample receipt from Google Image Search. Okay, so we can go ahead and lop off this. Okay, so what happened in the summary tables? So when we go over to the summary dashboard, we can see that July now exists. There's Janice, there's the marketing expenses. July got added down here as well. We have another bar in the bar chart. We didn't have to update anything. There was no need to update any ranges or refresh any pivot tables or do anything like that. Oh, I accidentally imported this hidden sheet. Those hidden sheets in, um, I don't need it. The hidden sheets from Excel, we can just get rid of that. Okay, so we have this here. Um, so, um, a couple questions. Let's see. If we name a table like an existing one, are we going to have a message? I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, you mean like rename this table? If I rename this table, just like expenses, something like that, it just renames it. How can we see at a glance if it's summary and the group by condition? So the default table name tells you the group by. So this is grouping by month. So you can tell if it's a summary table by this icon here. So a normal table doesn't have that icon. Summary tables have the sigma icon. That's how you can tell at a glance if it's a summary table. 
And then this little, the default name, you could override this name. So let's say somebody did override this name, something else, and you can't tell. If you just get rid of that, it'll go back to the default name, or you can just see it here because you can't change that. So that's how you can see at a glance how it's summarizing. Or over here in data, there's this group by. So as I click on these, you can see it also in the creator panel. That's another way. Okay. Um, so one more thing, some of you might be looking at this and seeing Janice Leary all caps here and title case here, and it, you need everything to be the same. Um, at least that's how I feel. So I'm going to show you a quick tip on just doing some quick data cleaning using trigger formulas. I use this all the time. So I'm going to create a trigger formula. So remember, trigger formulas are different from normal formulas uh, in that they only trigger when certain conditions are met and they can do some special things. We have a webinar all about trigger formulas that you can find on YouTube. So what I the because a trigger formula is in a data column, what's being stored in the cell is actual data, not the formula. You can refer to the value in a way that you you can't in a normal formula, where you would get a circular reference. Here, I can say take the value that is stored in this cell and do something to it. And what I want to do is the Python method for a title case. When I hit enter, nothing's going to happen because a trigger formula only happens with particular triggers. So what I want to do is apply on record changes, and there's a helpful one at the top called current field that you can use for data cleaning. It even says data cleaning right there. So what I want to do is I'm just going to, this is pretty short, pretty easy. I'm going to control C to copy it. I just delete it and then paste it again. And the title case just appeared there. So everything got fixed. That's a quick tip. I use um, trigger formulas for data cleaning all the time. Or sometimes for putting in sample data, like I'll do like random number generators and then just get rid of a formula. Like when you want to put in dummy data, you can kind of do it that way too. Okay, so let's take stock of where we are now. Um, the workflow right now has simplified quite a bit for accounting. You add a new expense, you don't need to touch anything. Nothing needs to be updated. It's automatically updating things and you can drill into this data a lot more easily. But there's still someone in accounting who needs to take all of these spreadsheets from everyone and add them to this master table. We can do better because we can use access rules to change um, uh, to allow people to come in here, only see what they need to see, add expenses directly without having to send anything to accounting, um, but not mess with anything else. So we can share this document with Janice, Robin, and Joey as editors, and when they come in, they can only edit their own expenses, see their own expenses, and not see the summary or anybody else's expenses. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so the first thing is I'm going to be adding them as editors. Let's go look at access rules real quick and let's sort of refresh our memory on default rules and what permissions mean. There's also a, a webinar that we did about access rules that's on YouTube that goes deeper. What we're doing today is a bit simpler. So the default rules are saying a user who's logged in, what is their access to this document? Are they a viewer, an editor, or an owner? And then in this case, if they're an editor or an owner, they can read the data, they can update data, they can create like additional records, they can delete data, and they also have schema edits. Schema edits let you um, create, edit, or delete tables, widgets, columns, pages, um, formatting on columns, and also formulas. Formulas are very powerful um, in general, but also in Grist because it lets you find additional data. And also it uh, sometimes is part of the magic of creating that application-like feeling. So it's very much a part of the structure. So we don't want editors to be able to edit the structure. So we're going to say, as we start typing, we can see that it's auto-filling and it's looking for user attributes. So Grist knows based on the access that you gave someone that you added to this document, what their access level is or what their login email is, their name, whatever it might be. So we're saying in this case, if their access equals editor, deny schema edits. That doesn't mean they can't update or create records. They can. They can still play within your structure. They can add additional records. They just can't change your structure. And notice that I use two equal signs. That's because access rules are written in a simplified version of Python. The documentation our support site pretty much tells you everything you need to know and what is supported. Um, but in Python, a single equal sign, you're defining a variable, but a double equal sign is a comparison. So we're actually here comparing what is the user's access is an editor. If it is, then deny them schema edits. Okay, so let's review what we want to do. We want to create row level rules where we're saying if the person, if the employee who is looking at this document is the person in this row, show them that row. Otherwise, do not show them that row. We could do this with name. You, um, Gris knows someone's name, but where does that name come from? 
it comes from profile settings, which is something that could be edited. So I typically, I wouldn't use username and access rules because if people change their names, um, it'll sort of mess up what they can see. Like, let's say I've been using my full name for many, many months and I've been incurring expenses and documenting them. And then one day I get a really cool nickname and then I edit this to my really cool nickname. The next time I log in, Gris is going to be looking at my really cool nickname and trying to match it, but all my previous expenses had my full name. So anything that the user can change could cause problems. I recommend using email, which can't be changed. And the great thing is you can automatically stamp emails with trigger formulas. So I'm going to add, I've right clicked here to insert a column to the left. I'm going to add email. Um, I can use a trigger formula to automatically stamp a user email. User attributes are only accessible from trigger formulas. You can't do this in a regular formula. So again, when I hit enter, nothing's gonna happen because it only triggers <laughs> when certain things happens right in the name. But if I were to create a new row, you can see that it's adding my name on a new row. Um, and you can do the same thing with username here. So I can change this to user.name. It is um, case sensitive and you can find this in our documentation as well. So I wanna apply that to new records. Um, so, Oh, I keep clicking on things. So let's um, come in here. I do this quickly with control semicolon to insert today's date. This is a shortcut for today's date. So you can see it's adding both my name and my email. I can't do this retroactively with trigger formulas. If you have hundreds or thousands of um, uh, rows here, you might want to find some other way to do it. Maybe you import people's names and emails, do reference lookups, there's other things you can do. But I only have here without these 26 rows. So I'm gonna do this a really cheap and easy way. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to right click and I'm gonna do filter by this value. So it's gonna filter by this value. Um, so I'm just gonna start making up emails because these people don't exist. Um, I'm copying this just to make my life easier real quick. So what I do here is with this selection, with the shortcut control D, the value at the top will get filled into the end. So it just gets filled in. I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm just gonna do the same for the other two. So I'm gonna make this. So sometimes this is also a way to do really quick data entry or cleaning when you're coming over. It really depends on your use case. Um, okay, filling this in. And I also wanna copy his name because I'm gonna use him as my guinea pig. Okay, so I'm gonna add Joey to this document so I can spoof as him, view things as him. Um, he's gonna be an editor so I can see things as Joey as I start creating rules. So let's go over to access rules. We're gonna create a rule for the expenses table. So in the expenses table, um, if the user accesses owner, so this is uh, the accountant, they can see everything. They're allowed to see everything. But now somebody who's logged in, look at their email, just like we did with user access. Look at their access, in this case, look at their email when they're logged in. And now we're gonna create row level rules by saying, look at each individual record and then look in the email column. If there's a match between what's stamped in that email column in the table and their login email, then allow everything. In all other cases, deny. So if they're not the owner or if that record doesn't match their email, they can't see that data. So now under users, I'm gonna view as Joey, my dummy case here. So Joey can only see his own um, expenses. So we're already making this a bit easier, but we're gonna go a bit further. So one thing that I wanted to um, reveal here is, remember we hid the month column? Hiding it isn't the same as restricting with access rules. So we didn't actually restrict Joey from seeing it. So he can still see the name in hidden columns. And if he goes to raw data, he can still see the month here. If you actually wanna restrict it, hiding it isn't enough. You need to restrict it from access rules. So let's go ahead and we're gonna restrict month and email and employee. Why are we restricting email and employee? We're auto stamping these and we don't want them to go and change it. Like if Joey suddenly starts going by JR, it's gonna mess up our summary tables where we're summarizing things by Joey's name. So we're gonna just make sure that he can't edit that and just leave that to accounting. So let's go to access rules. On this table with this three dot menu, we can start adding column rules. So we want to prevent them from editing their name, their email, and we'll hide the month column just so you can see what I was talking about. So if the user access is an owner, all good. Everybody else, deny. So what we're saying here is in this table in general, 
you can see these records, but there's some exceptions, these columns you cannot see. So now let's go look at it as Joey again. So now in the hidden columns, there's no month anymore. And when we go to raw data, he can't see those um, columns that we restricted. Before he could see month, email, and that's all gone now. Okay. The last thing we want to do is hide um, the expenses summary. And also just for myself as the owner, this just feels like clutter. So I'll just hide it. I'm hiding it for myself, but I can still access it because I didn't restrict myself from seeing it. So we want to hide this summary dashboard here. Um, so you, the summary tables are here. Um, there'll be some improvements to that soon that we've been working on. Um, but uh, so let's see. What I want to say is if you're the owner, you can see it. Everybody else cannot see it. So I'm just going to make this easier and just copy and paste um, and deny all. Technically, hiding one widget is enough to hide the whole thing, but that's a behavior that might change. Access rules have been in beta. We're going to pull them out of beta by improving some things. Um, I need condition. So um, it's better to be thorough and make sure that nothing can be found. So. This is the best practice, even though technically if you hide one of the widgets, the whole page will hide. Okay, so I think I got everything. So again, go in, do it as Joey. He can't see the summary dashboard anymore. All he can do is come in here. He only sees his own expenses and he can edit expenses. He can add stuff. So let's go ahead and add a few tests here. We'll add one to June, one to July. Let's do ops and I don't know, administration. I'm just sort of picking at random. Um, so we can just find this. So he, so Joey came in, he logged in with these access rules. He's updating his expenses. So let's see what the owner sees. They're going to see one weird thing and I'll explain it in a minute. Um, so here's those expenses at the end of the table. We can see everything. You'll notice his name isn't here, but that's because Joey doesn't really exist. There's no actual Grist account with a profile setting for a name for Joey. So that's why nothing is being pulled. Um, it's still being pulled for somebody who does have a Grist account like myself. If Joey had an account, his name would be um, pasting in here, but for now it's not. So we'll just put it in as if that had happened because he doesn't exist. Okay, so let's go over to the dashboard here. We can see in June, Joey now has that operations expense. In July, he's got this administration expense. Everything is updating. You can see these charts are updating as well. So the workflow is a lot easier. Accounting no longer needs to reconcile all these different sheets, um, update any formulas. All they need to do is just email the rest of the team every month to remind them to go update their expenses in Grist, and that's it. So it's a lot easier. Oh, one more thing. I got through that a little quicker than I thought. Um, sometimes you might need to still export things. So let's say uh, I'm the owner, I'm accountant, and uh, somebody wants in a spreadsheet, they want to see only administration and finance expenses in June, and they don't want it in the summary dash for whatever reason. So um, what you can do is you can filter. So I'm going to go ahead and filter those two things. So I'm going to filter the month. I want only June. Um, and then I want uh, by account only administration and finance. If I save that filter, I can, so you can see there's 10 rows here. Joey and Robin, I can download that as a CSV. And if I open that, Excel's taking sweet time. You can see here, it's just giving me the things that I had filtered for. Um, so that's really helpful as well if you need to push things out. Though the way that I just did it, when I did this filter, if anyone else was in this document at the same time, they're gonna see this jumping around. So I would actually recommend um, not doing it in the copy that everybody else could see. You could always work on a copy that creates an unsaved fork and then do it there so that the underlying one that everybody else might be working on doesn't jump around on them, which might just lead to some confusion. So you could just do it here, apply the filter and then export that CSV because somebody for some reason isn't using Gris, I don't know why, so they want that CSV. Okay, we can open it up for questions. Is there a way to fetch the data of the summary table through the API? I believe so, because it has a table ID, but maybe Dimitri would be able to answer this a bit more. Um, I haven't done it, but there is, you saw, you saw it here, there's this ID. 
Yes, uh, uh, I believe you can. Um, mm -hmm. the, the only difficulty is knowing the ID of the table because mm -hmm. in a way it's a hidden table. Um, but I think as Anais mentioned uh, that those uh, there are places when you do need to know it and we, are, um, we have a, a project to make it less hidden. So you could actually see what the tables are and have a way to refer to them with kind of more sensible names. Um, for now, uh, the difficulty is figuring out the name of the table. Uh, I don't think I can say a rule off the top of my head how to find it. So the best thing is to ask in the community forum if you need it now. But I think within a few weeks, there might be a better way. Yeah, we were just talking about it this week, so fingers crossed. <laughs> And similarly, once you do figure out the names, you can also call on them in formulas. Sometimes that's helpful. I don't know if there's any other questions. Thanks for joining, Eduardo. I see a lot of familiar names, which always makes me happy. What do you mean by highlight all the row like this? Um, you could do zebra stripes. It's very subtle. Maybe we can make that a little darker. You can do zebra stripes on any table, uh, which makes things a little bit easier as you're scanning across. And uh, you could also do conditional formatting if you wanted to highlight certain things as well. We can highlight this way. If you click on the left side, it'll highlight it in green. Thanks, Carol. Videos about widget. Um, there's a webinar about productive layouts that uh, dives a bit more deeply into widgets and their configuration and what you can do with them. But well, we could do one specifically about widgets as well. What would you want to see in a widgets video? Yes, so when you're in a widget um, and you're in the table section here, you can go to data or you, you're talking about editing the underlying data or the data. Itself. So anything that I, in any of these widgets, well, these are all formulas and summary tables. But if I edit something here, you are editing the underlying table. So the view and, um, and the data itself is a little bit blurred in that way. Or if you want to edit the actual underlying data, like in the summary table, if I want to change the group by columns, you can go to edit data selection and play with things here. Maybe there's different tables here and you want to change something. And you can also change the select by here if you missed it while you were building it. I think sometimes people don't realize it's here. So when you're adding new, um, like when you're adding a new widget to page and you start doing things like this, it lets you select by, if you missed it here, which is kind of easy to miss, you can do it over here as well.
we want to make a gallery view with a checkbox to change the status field. So there's a status field that's like a choice column. I understand the checkbox part. When the check when something is checked, the status changes. You can do that with a formula. I think we have an example uh, in the community where it's a formula in a choice. This column where it like pulls up a different choice that has a different color. You can do that. Um, gallery view. Do you mean like a card or a custom widget? But yeah, you can you can put a formula in a choice column that then pulls up a particular choice based on whether or not a toggle column is true or false. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I'm going to stop sharing and see if I can find that example and then pull it up instead of building it now. Or if Natalie could find it, I don't know. Who's, it'll be a race. But people can keep sending questions and try to find it. Because this is the example here. No. Custom widget with a list of pictures so I can choose quickly some images, for example. Let's see. So would that be different than this? I'm trying to picture. It's not a custom widget. This is our attachments column. Um, so it'll list it and then you can open it and go through the carousel. I think you missed that. You said you joined a few minutes late and I covered this in the very beginning, which is you could do a custom widget to show that gallery or you can attach multiple images within the same cell and attachment column and then you can scroll through them. As for is cover think- true, yeah, that might be a bit trickier. Yeah, I think I understand the question. I guess that um, there, you you can imagine a, a table where one of the images has is cover set to true. That's the mm-hmm. image that's selected, maybe for a certain category or something. Um, but how to kind of set that setting from a custom widget? Um, that is possible, but that but that requires coding on the custom widget side. So whoever is uh, writing the code for the custom widget could uh, uh, issue an action when you click on the image to set um, a field in the appropriate record. Do you think you need a custom widget? I wonder if you could just do it with the formula and attachment column, which I saw someone do, (laughs) it's pretty cool. Yeah, you can always just have a checkbox for his cover and check it to true. Uh, I think mm-hmm. there was a question in the community forum to, uh, for if you check, uh, sometimes you went to a situation and if you check one uh, one record in a one cell in a column, you check one of them, all the other ones get unchecked automatically. Uh, if you search the community forum, I think there is a, a recipe for, for doing that. It's possible to do with trigger formulas. Mm-hmm. Yeah.
Okay, so if there's no more questions, I think we can wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Natalie, for the link. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you have ideas for what you want us to cover in um, future webinars, also drop those suggestions in the forum or I guess email us. We're always looking for ideas. Okay. Bye.